adults and children, a national multi-site, multi-method study in 2003. Until then, only anecdotal evidence was being reported about the advantages of simulation, but it needed to be backed up with well-designed and executed research. Debbie was one of the first people selected to participate in the study and was clearly the most experienced. Seven other faculty members from schools across the country were selected. Debbie never flaunted her expertise, but provided leadership in her own quiet way. The group of eight strangers developed quickly into a close-knit family with Debbie as the big sister. She was a very private person and rarely talked about herself, but she loved to talk about her daughter, Ellen. In 2006, as the study was in its final phases, we decided to use the NLN's technology conference to disseminate the outcomes of the study and to hold that conference at the University of Maryland. Debbie was thrilled that we were using her school where she earned her baccalaureate and master's degrees and where she was coming close to completing her DNP program. She welcomed all the attendees and was in perpetual motion during the event, speaking from the podium and providing tours of her labs. A few short months later, Debbie learned that her cancer had returned and further treatment was futile. When Tor Lairdall, chairman and CEO of Lairdall Medical, became aware that Debbie was terminally ill, he contacted the NLN to establish a way to honor all that Debbie had done for simulation and nursing. I visited Debbie just a few days before she died to tell her that a lecture was being established in her name. She was all dressed up in her cap and gown. She was so proud of that doctorate and thrilled and honored that her contributions would be recognized every year at the NLN summit with a lecture provided by others who have had a lasting impact on the evolution of the art and science of simulation. Following Dr. Spunt's death at the age of 50 in March of 2007, the school named the labs in her memory and established the Deborah L. Spunt Clinical Simulation Practice and Research Endowment, which allows the University of Maryland School of Nursing to remain on the cutting edge of simulation education. Everyone who knew Debbie has very special memories of her and her impact on their life and work in simulation. Mine is seeing her at her induction into the Academy of Nursing. She was so proud to have her daughter Ellen with her on such a special day. My other special memory is bittersweet, seeing her face light up when I told her about the endowed lecture funded by Lairdall that would carry her name. When I asked Debbie to select the first person to deliver the Spunt lecture, she quickly replied, Pam, of course. Then from her bed, she pointed to a small framed picture of her and Pam in full finery taken at the Academy induction ceremony. She told me to give the picture to Pam after she delivered the first Spunt lecture. Six months later, I did so from the podium of the NLN summit, fighting back tears. While there is no question that Debbie's pioneering efforts and leadership brought simulation to the forefront, I think it was her warm personality and giving spirit that was equally important. She was one of the kindest and most generous people I have ever known. She was quiet and unassuming and always willing to share whatever she learned with others. All you had to do was ask or let her know you were struggling. Debbie recognized the benefits of simulation early on and the art and science advanced more quickly because Debbie was there. Freely sharing her knowledge during the earliest days of simulation's use in nursing education, cheering everyone on. 
every new innovation, especially in education, needs someone like Dr. Spunt so that the diffusion of innovation cycle accelerates newly found knowledge about the best ways to educate our students and find its way to the educator toolbox quickly with an outcome of better educated students and better patient care. Thank you for all you did to lead and inspire us, Dr. Deborah Spunt. You touched our minds and our hearts, and we miss you still. And thank you, Dr. Marianne Rizzolo, for your wonderful accounting of Deborah L. Spunt. And so the saga continues, and may our saga continue as we bring to a close this episode of Nursing Edge Unscripted saga. Thank you for joining us. And remember, good teaching doesn't just happen. Find your fit, push the boundaries, and celebrate the ahas. Welcome to the 2022 Deborah Spunt Lecture. Please welcome to the stage the 2022 Spunt Lecturer, Dr. Kim Layton, Executive Director of ITCON Clinical Simulation and Innovation Center at Hamad Medical Corporation in Doha, Qatar. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for getting up so early on this last day of the conference, and um, hopefully you've had time for your coffee. Um, I know that um, people who know me well, I have more than one bottle of uh, Diet Pepsi here with me today. So um, I wanna start by thanking the National League for Nursing Foundation and Laerdal Medical for sponsoring the Deborah Elspunt Memorial Lecture. I never met Deborah. I think I'm one of the few speakers who never had that really rich, wonderful opportunity to learn from her and what a visionary leader she was and long lasting impact on simulation and nursing education. And I think she really laid that early foundation for us to um, share. We've always been known in simulation as being willing to share our information, our scenarios, our ideas. And so I thank her for that. I'm really honored to have been asked to share some of my thoughts with you today. I've been a nurse for 40 years now, and mostly in the emergency department. I moved to education and simulation about 20 years ago. It was the best career decision ever. Today I manage a large simulation center in the Middle East, and my research has focused on evaluation of simulation outcomes, but now it's become bigger. It's become more about clinical outcomes in general in nursing education. And here's what I found, okay? We're a hot mess. So my goals for today are to stir the pot, to make you think about what we're doing and why, and to hope that at the end of the session, you want to take some action to help fix or make this situation better. So what is the situation that I talk about? Well, we really are in the middle of a perfect storm and nursing education is at a crossroads. So let me tell you about why I think that is. I'm going to start with a brief overview of nursing and nursing education in general. 
And I'll follow that with what we know about learning outcomes related to all of our different clinical environments. I'll share some ideas about how we can apply the healthcare simulation standards of best practice to our traditional clinical. And then I'm going to explain why I think we shouldn't be talking anymore about how to replace traditional clinical with simulation and the bigger picture that we need to be addressing instead. Okay, so we've had a nursing shortage for decades, except for the year I graduated. <laughs> okay, that was 1982. For those of you in the room, you'll remember it was nursing home or nothing, unless you already had a job as a nursing assistant in a hospital. I see lots of nodding heads. You remember that. It's different now, though. It's different because COVID made it different. It really exacerbated the problems that we have. You know, reports of RNs leaving the workforce, 20 to 34 percent are the predictions. Then we lost thousands of nurses during COVID who either resigned, and unfortunately we lost a lot to the, the illness, the disease itself. Nurses are burned out. Mental health issues like anxiety, depression, increased suicide rates are really prevalent. Nurses are caring for people who are angry and they're frustrated and they're uncivil some days and they can be abusive. There was just a survey released um, last week and they found that 65% of 400,000 nurses, so it was a pretty big survey. They reported they had been verbally or physically assaulted by a patient or a patient's family in this past year. Difficult to want to work in that environment. We've long had challenges with clinical education of nursing students. The faculty shortage continues. We again turned away over 80,000 qualified applicants in 2020 because there's not enough faculty and clinical sites to teach them. 30% of faculty are expected to retire in 2025. Remember when that seemed like a long way away? <laughs> Some of the people in this room will not be working anymore by then. <laughs> While newly graduated nurses, they can help. They can help impact the shortage but we have to remember, during their nursing school, they didn't have clinical sites to go to because they couldn't be protected. Or the schools closed, so we couldn't do simulation anymore because we couldn't meet the social distancing requirements. And we didn't know if it was safe. So in our efforts to protect our students, we also lost our clinical hours. So when I did my dissertation work in, it was uh, 2007, I finished it. And it was at the same time that the National Council of Nursing was wondering whether simulation could replace traditional clinical. And I'm like, hmm, okay, well, we don't even know if they're similar in any way. So that was my, um, my research, and that ended up with the Clinical Learning Environment Comparison Survey. And at that time, only two of the 27 learning needs were met in the traditional clinical environment, or I'm sorry, in simulation. It was having an instructor available to you and receiving immediate feedback on the performance. Now, we use the CLEX results to help improve both our um, clinical environment and our simulation environment. Then in 2014, the National Council of State Boards of Nursing use the CLEX as one of their outcome tools for the big multi-site landmark study that found that 50% of clinical could be replaced with simulation under certain conditions. And I find it necessary to remind people what those conditions were. Um, the certain conditions are that you have formally trained faculty in simulation pedagogy that use of theory-based debriefing methods using subject matter experts. Adequate numbers of simulation faculty, we don't have adequate faculty for anything. 
um, and equipment and supplies to create that realistic environment. So where are we at with this replacement now? The International Nursing Association for Clinical Simulation and Learning, or INAXL, has a map on their website where you can check your state to see what their current regulations are. And the QR code is there if you want to scan it later for easy access. Or you can scan it now. A significant amount of research has been done, meanwhile, to examine outcomes of simulation. So we have found that well done simulation can impact critical thinking, clinical judgment, prioritization, teamwork, communication, anxiety, confidence, and we can impact patient outcomes. One example is the, I always have to look, um, central line associated bloodstream infections, CLABC. That's one example of where simulation has made a difference. Now in 2018, I joined a team, um, one of the team is in the room, and we did an umbrella review of outcomes related to um, simulation-based education for nurses and nursing students. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar, an umbrella review is a review of all reviews. It, you really should think about that before you say yes. <laughs> um, yeah. 97 systematic reviews of simulation research were included in our umbrella review. That's a lot of systematic reviews. Now, one of our four themes was learner outcomes and skill acquisition. So in the cognitive domain, simulation impacted problem solving, critical thinking, clinical judgment, and helped nurses recognize the salient cues earlier and made them more aware of changes in the patient's condition. In the psychomotor domain, we learned that we need to give them more practice time for everything. And we also found that it increased self-confidence. Meanwhile, we're really excited at the growth of research into learning outcomes in our new virtual environments. So we have virtual reality, we have augmented reality, we have mixed reality, and groups of researchers are really heavily focusing and quickly focusing on getting these methods studied and disseminated out into the world. It just feels like there's been exponential growth in that particular area, which you know, was supported by our needs during COVID. So now let's look at screen-based simulation. So a lot of you probably did this during the pandemic because what options did you have really? We had to figure out new ways of teaching in the space of days. Some of you did it on a weekend. Some of you did not have your spring break. So we had to figure out how are we going to promote learning, active learning on a computer? And what is Zoom anyway? <laughs> and then we had to figure out teams and, and they were vastly different from each other. What available simulation products already existed that we could use? but we still had to figure out how to use them. We had to see how these products worked, if they met our learning objectives, and then we had to communicate all this to our students in, in the midst of all of our anxiety about what was happening. But the faculty did a fantastic job getting all of this figured out. It was really amazing when you think back on that, that time period. And of course, special thanks to our vendors who really waived their fees for the first six months, the first year. They kept extending it so that, that we had a way to teach our students. So at that time, colleagues and I revised the CLEX to become the CLEX 2.0. And we studied how well were learning needs met in the traditional clinical environment, and what I now call the traditional simulation environment, and screen-based simulation. We didn't include virtual reality because we didn't believe that the students had the ability to do virtual reality in their homes at that point in time. The findings that none of the clinical learning needs 
were best met, not even close, <laughs> in the screen-based environment, it wasn't a surprise. We anticipated that the results were gonna be a little ugly, but we also thought it was important to get a baseline to follow on this year and the next year. Now, interestingly, some state boards of nursing allowed the newly developed and unstudied uh, screen-based simulation to replace traditional clinical. Now, granted, we were in a pandemic, but that quick approval was fascinating to see for me because there was no research to support the outcomes. And so it was such a different pathway than we took with traditional clinical or traditional simulation. When we look at replacing one clinical method with another, all of our ways of teaching are compared to the traditional clinical model. <clears throat> Excuse me, the gold standard. Well, what is it that happens in traditional clinical that makes this the gold standard? So, colleagues and I set off on a systematic review of what learning outcomes are reached using traditional clinical learning environments in undergraduate pre-licensure programs. We used every name for clinical that we could find. And we've come up with a lot of them over the years. So we had 43 search terms looking for clinical. <coughs> Excuse me. We assumed we would find a lot of clinically related outcomes because this is what we've been doing. This is our gold standard for decades, right, since form. We found nothing, not one study that met the inclusion criteria. Usually, it's called an empty review. They're kind of hard to get published. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but what usually, the cause usually is that you don't have enough search terms and your inclusion criteria is too narrow. And that, uh, we had 43. They, that was enough search terms in, in our eyes. But what I wanna say is just because we didn't find it doesn't mean it hasn't been done. There may be some of you sitting in the audience thinking, well, I published this, I published that. But we learned a lot about keywords and abstracts during this process and how they don't always match the articles that are found. So it could be that they're there, but we couldn't find them with our, our methods. At the end, we had nothing. So then we thought, maybe it's in the qualitative literature. So we did exactly the same search, the systematic review of qualitative literature, looking for the learning outcomes. We found six papers that were not even remotely similar in any way. So, so we weren't able to make any recommendations based on those six articles. Um, we, we looked at a paper from clinical during the night shift, clinical in another country, things like that, but there was just nothing that was similar. So then, colleagues and I decided to look at the competency of our newly graduated nurses. So readiness to practice has been studied for over 15 years using the performance-based development system, I can never get the letters right, PBDS, that was developed by um, Del Bueno. So in 2005, her study found that 35% of newly graduated nurses were adequately prepared to be nurses. Well, let's flip that. That means 65% of them weren't prepared. That's a problem. But that's also, if you look back at the history, that's when you started seeing residency programs and internship programs for new hires. So this has been studied longitudinally and over the last 15 years, it's declined to 9%. 9% of newly graduated nurses are prepared to safely provide patient care. So think about nursing education as a business and only 9% of our product is ready for market. Exactly, we have to fix this. It's long past time to really get serious about this 
all these numbers are before COVID. I am scared to see what's going to happen in the next study. So, but we need some short-term wins while we plan this big solution, right? There's a couple of things I want to share that we've done in simulation that I think could be helpful for traditional clinical. So the healthcare simulation standards of best practice were first developed in 2011 by the INAXL board, and they were based on the best available evidence found in the research. So they're now in their fourth edition, so oh, that's over 10 years now. I believe there's an opportunity to borrow from simulation to test these ideas, these standards in other clinical environments. They can be used along with the competencies for nursing educators issued by the NLN and the World Health Organization. Um, I put the QR code on here so you can easily access these standards. I think no matter where you work and no matter what your specialty is, you, if you critically look through those, you will find ways to make some adaptations to your clinical environment. I'll share some um, to get you started. So first let's look at, we call it pre-briefing in simulation. In the clinical world, we call it pre-conference. So we know from simulation that deliberately designing pre-briefing and preparation activities can decrease cognitive load demands on our learner, decrease anxiety, increase psychological safety, and increase effectiveness of the experience. And we know that because we have the research that shows us that. We develop pre-briefing according to the purpose and the learning objectives of the activity. We consider the experience and the knowledge level of the learners. So let me ask you, when you go to clinical every, not every day, because some only go once a week, right, for four or six hours, do you have learning objectives for each day of your clinical? And do the nurses on the clinical site understand what it is that you're trying to accomplish? And can you accomplish that no matter what the patients are available to you that day? If you, you know, how do you assure that the patients that you have align with the level of the learner's knowledge and skills? So I used to take students to orthotrauma, first clinical experience for them, first year of nursing school. Orthotrauma, automatically, it's not gonna work, is it? So, <laughs> but what options do we have when there's not enough clinical sites? So, so I get to choose between the person who got hit by the train, the person who jumped out of the second floor window and broke both heels in a suicide attempt, or I get to choose the lady who has the fractured hip. Now you would think, ah, I'm gonna pick number C, letter C. But she laid on the floor for four days, had rhabdomyolysis, and needed dialysis. How does this work with brand new students? I, it, it's really challenging, I, I, I get it. But do we still have our students preparing by memorizing their medications and the side effects? and all the possible doses, and all the possible interactions, or do we let them use the app that's on their phone? Or the app that's on the desktop computer in the clinical environment? Because we're really kind of setting them up to guess. And that's not, that's the hidden curriculum, right? We don't want them to guess. That's a disaster in the making. <laughs> Thank you. we can have them use that saved time in a way that helps them anticipate what could go wrong with their patient, what their patient will look like when that happens, and how they can quickly identify that. Because if we stop having them prepare at that level, we've freed up a whole lot of time. Pre-briefing intends to establish a psychologically safe environment by creating a common mental model. Preparing students for success, sharing the ground rules for the day, and we need to make sure that our learners are comfortable sharing their thoughts and concerns without fear of negative consequences. 
So we have to establish this environment of integrity and safety and trust and respect. But instead, if they do something wrong, you're going to write a whole bunch of stuff on their clinical evaluation. And the next instructor is going to see it, and the next instructor is going to see it, and there is no opportunity for psychological safety. Now let's look at the debriefing standard and compare it with post-conference. So we believe in simulation that most of the learning takes place during debriefing after the simulated patient care. As a clinical instructor, I hated post-conference. I hated it. I found anything on the unit for those students to do so that we didn't have to have post-conference. <laughs> I didn't know why. I didn't understand what post-conference was. I didn't understand the purpose of it because I didn't have any mentoring to become a clinical instructor. Now, oh yes, I would be briefed all day long. It wouldn't be at post-conference time. It would be whenever it was needed. I would be briefed with individual students. I would be briefed with whoever was available to me. And then, if I do these short debriefings during the day, I can gather the information I've learned, and that supports the post-conference. For example, I could say, how's your morning going for you? Or, I noticed that when you were giving the bath, the patient had already asked for a pain pill. Can you tell me what you were thinking at that time? We call those structures type of questions, Socratic questions and advocacy inquiry. I notice, what do you think? Tell me why. I didn't know that type of questioning existed until I came to debriefing and simulation. If I had known, I could have had a more productive post-conference for sure. Um, if you ask advocacy inquiry questions, it will lead the learner to reflect. And it's in the reflection that the learning occurs. So I think that's a really great opportunity for us as clinical educators. Okay, so a lot of you know, like, evaluation's my thing. Um, I like to, to evaluate the learner ourselves as facilitators and educators and the experiences that we create. And I'm really concerned about the evaluation tools that we use in traditional clinical. Several pages long. You write what you learned about the student during the day, even if you only spent 10 minutes, 15 minutes with that student. Usually, the student who doesn't do so well gets a lot of space, right? Need an extra page for them. The students that you think were doing fine, they get to clinical and we're like, oh dear, they're really not as, as doing as well as we all thought they were. But we didn't recognize it because in clinical, we don't have enough time to spend with our students to recognize their deterioration, just like our patients. My other concern is I've never worked or consulted at a school that's done any kind of testing on their clinical evaluation instruments. There's no analyzing the validity, the reliability of the data that's produced by that, and they're completely subjective. So if we don't have inter-rater reliability, which I've also not seen reported on in the literature, <coughs> excuse me, are we failing patients be, or students because we don't use the proper evaluation instrument or properly train faculty on how to use them correctly? Clinical assessment is high stakes. If you get enough use on your clinical evaluation, you will fail the clinical. And then if you fail the clinical because of the way we've got it tied in with the course in our curricula, then they fail the course. If you do this twice, you fail the program. But we're not using the right tools and we're not using them um, the same way. So I think that's another place for us to really work on. Now you'll notice when you start looking at the standards, there's a constant, constant reference to training. The debriefer must be trained in the pedagogy. The evaluators must be trained. 
The facilitators must be trained. The pre-briefers must be trained. Everybody needs to be trained. This last set, there's even a standard for professional development. So at the same time, my colleagues and I were looking at this, we identified that there was a potential gap in the preparation of our clinical instructors. So I have a note here that says read from the slide, but my old eyes can't see it, so I'm just gonna bend over and read it. <laughs> just bear with me. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, oh, I, my eyes are really old. Um, it, it's basically, <laughs> Okay, the short version is that we are lacking performance evaluation of our clinical instructors. We still tend to identify good nurses and deem them qualified to teach. Even though they're vastly different skill sets, we learned that with simulation when we put every skills lab instructor and made them a simulation instructor. It doesn't work. It's different ways of teaching and evaluating. So I attended a session two days ago by Dr. Susan Binden. I don't know if you're here this morning, but she described a program, a training program that they use in Maryland, and it's designed to train nurses into the clinical educator role. And one of the things they do is they use standardized students, like standardized patients. Mm-hmm. Interesting, huh? So what they've done is they've set up an opportunity to do that um, observation, that assessment, if you will, using objective structured teaching assessment or evaluation. So OSTEs instead of OSCEs. When we did our, our work on this, we did find reference to OSTEs in the medical education literature all over the place. We did not find it once in the nursing literature. So if anybody needs a dissertation topic in the audience, this might be a good place to start. Okay, so I've briefly shared with you some of the ways that we can use the healthcare simulation standards of best practice to consider changes that might improve our clinical education. But I really think we could talk about this all day long. We're not going to. This is why, though, all of this information is why I think we need to stop thinking about replacing clinical environments with other clinical environments that aren't equal. So there's always discussion about how many hours of simulation can replace clinical. And during the pandemic, it was okay to replace clinical with screen-based simulation. And when you look at these experiences side by side, they're not equal, okay? Lemons, apples, cherries. We need to try to stop replacing one environment with the other. We need to stop focusing on a random number of hours for clinical activities. <laughs> but this, this requires letting go of the assumption that this prescribed number of traditional clinical hours actually prepares students for the registered nurse role, because we have 15 years worth of data that says it doesn't. These decisions are based on opinion. They're not based on evidence. So I challenge us to establish that evidence. Continue to explore what learning outcomes occur in all of our different clinical environments, for example, I would suggest that skills are best taught in a skills lab. It's, it's that easy. <laughs> but we know we don't give our students enough time to practice when they're in the skills lab. <laughs> Certainly not enough to develop any sort of competency. Um, we know that from the work of Anders Ericsson, who I really had the pleasure of meeting him, uh, a, a little bit before he passed, that practice needs to be deliberate. It requires repetition, and it requires immediate feedback. 
Now, a lot of us will give extra practice time off hours when we're not there and let the students come in. Sometimes they come, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they practice correctly. Probably sometimes they don't. So, if they don't establish, if they don't do the practice and learn things correctly, then we've allowed them to learn it incorrectly. We also don't establish integrated reliability for any of our assessors in the skills lab. <laughs> I know my experience was on day one of the semester, we would all sit around a table and we would agree that we were all going to make them follow these memorized checklists in a certain way. <clears throat> and then at the end of the semester, we would go through the evaluations. Well, X didn't make us do it that way. Y showed us a different way to do it, and, and their way is better than your way. And it's like, what happened to this whole agreement that we had? Now, in many schools, if the student doesn't follow the checklist, remember the one we make them memorize? <clears throat> if they don't follow it correctly three times, what happens? They fail, they fail that skill and they have to make it up at the end of the session. Unless they do that twice, in which case we're just gonna fail them out of the whole lab, which means they fail out of the whole course and have to take and pay for the whole thing again. And if they do that twice, we kick them out of the program and they have to reapply. We're using high stakes exams and failing learners out of a program, but we're not using good practice for skill development or assessment. <clears throat> this is on us to fix this. So what can best be taught in mannequin based simulation? I'm just gonna grab a drink here, sorry. It gets kind of dry up here after you just talk all the time. Okay, so in mannequin-based simulation, we have a plethora of research about our learning outcomes related to what we do in there. So we need to, I think, consider better how we choose our patients for our scenarios. So we spend a significant amount of time teaching to the extremes. Okay, raise your hand if you've ever actually seen epiglottitis. Okay, I know what you do for a living, so that doesn't surprise me. But for those of you on the edges, there was only about four people who raised their hand. So why are we gonna do a scenario on epiglottitis? We don't have enough time as it is. But what we can do is we can focus on concepts <clears throat> like respiratory. So what if we did simulation specifically for pattern recognition. So perhaps we have a heart failure patient. We know that heart failure is the most common admission diagnosis outside of OB in a hospital. We can't guarantee that in clinical, our students all take care of a heart failure patient. We can do that in simulation. We can teach them how to take care of a heart failure patient or we can have a heart failure patient, a patient with pneumonia, a patient with asthma, a, a little baby with croup. And they can see how what they're hearing with their stethoscope in the skills lab, how that sound looks on the patient. And then we as the instructors, we can um, make that situation so that they have to intervene. So then they learn what does that person look like? What am I supposed to do about it? Oh, what did I see before I did something about it that maybe I should have caught that sooner? So if we consider pattern recognition, we might make even more progress. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay, what can best be taught in virtual, augmented, or mixed reality? This is really rapidly evolving, <clears throat> but it's a great place for teaching concepts that aren't available in our traditional clinical environments or that they're not safe for our students to do in clinical environments. So we all know that if the student's patient codes, they end up all the way out in the hallway. They don't even get to barely watch anymore except from the door. So how do they learn that? 
Well, they can learn it in mannequin-based simulation. They can learn it in virtual reality. The beauty of virtual reality and augmented and mixed is that the machine can provide the feedback. So you, it does decrease instructor time. The machine can tell you how deep are the compressions, how fast or too slow did you do um, the respiration. So there's a big um, opportunity, if you will, with the different realities. And then with screen-based simulation, I think we need to closely, very closely, look at what Yale did during the pandemic and what do you want to keep? What went really well? What can you just modify to make some improvements? And what did you do that you never want to do again? Because there's some of that too. But you also have to think, okay, well, we tried this and it worked great and the students loved it, but it took, you know, eight days of our time to set it up. Like, that's not um, going to be efficient and effective for you as faculty either. Now, as I mentioned, we're unsure about what our learning outcomes happen in traditional clinical education. But we do know that that's where the students learn how to be a nurse. It's hard to put that into words, but it's been called professional comportment. Okay, so it's a dimension of nursing practice that comes from being with other nurses and being in that clinical environment, and not just with nurses, but with other health professions as well. That's something that we struggle with in simulation. We're working very hard to get better with interprofessional education, IPE, but many of us know the challenges of that, and it's scheduling. How do you match up the nurse's schedule with the physician's schedule with the respiratory therapist's schedule? And it is pretty labor intensive. So we have a seemingly arbitrary and wide range of numbers of hours that our degree programs must adhere to. While we're all tasked with producing generalist nurses who take the same licensure exam, we sure have a big range of hours that we use to accomplish that. We were just talking at dinner last night about going from you know, a model that has 180-ish hours and comparing that with like the diploma model that had 1,500 to 3,000 hours of clinical. We're having to condense all this. And as I mentioned earlier, it's eminence versus evidence. Right? It's relying on what people that we believe have the expert knowledge of pulling numbers out and saying this is what you need for a good nurse. We need the evidence. So what is a generalist nurse? And why are, why are we teaching to an advanced level? Right? We're teaching critical care skills. We're teaching advanced ideas when they don't even know how to put their stethoscope in the right direction. <laughs> so this definition is according to the new AACN essentials that recently came out. So it says that the nurse practices as a generalist across the lifespan and with diverse populations. And they focus on these four spheres of care. Our graduates are to be generalists not specialists, and I want you to really remember that when I get to what I want you to do about all of this. Now, think about the past year. COVID-19 led to the need to better understand public health. Our nursing graduates need to understand public health. They need to understand the, thank you. They need to understand the role of vaccines and immunization. Polio's a threat again. Who ever thought that would happen? Telemedicine was implemented. And granted, many people have been doing telemedicine for a very long time, but it exploded during COVID. And where I live, telemedicine meant that the doctor would call me. And I would get two minutes. So we also implemented more wearable devices. We have diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, belonging. We have social determinants of health. These need to be 
in every course. We really need to look at these because there's a lot of reasons our patients are unhealthy. We have impoverished patients. We have uneducated patients. We have those who don't understand our language and we don't understand theirs. So communication's a challenge. We have migrants, we have immigrants, we have people coming to the U.S. to escape war. They're not always provided with services when they cross the border. So this is where nursing can come in because it's a health problem. We have many refugee location centers in different um, communities across our country that need to have health care standards raised. We need to be culturally aware of how to best meet these learners or these um, people's health needs. What about women's health? Okay, those of you who are teaching women's health certainly have your work cut out for you in updating your curriculums. And it's changing quickly and it's changing drastically. Mental health issues are at an all time high. Where are you gonna teach all this? This is from two years of changes. What are you gonna get rid of? Because that's the real problem, isn't it? We, we all have our thing we wanna teach and we don't wanna give it up, but we have to. We have to have these difficult conversations. And don't do it just for your course, and don't do it just for your program, because every course and every nursing program in this country needs to make these same changes. So I'm, I'm hoping that you don't do it in isolation. So carefully and critically think about this. We spend, <laughs> I know why you're laughing. Are you still doing it? I heard somebody say, it drives me crazy. It drives me crazy too. So we spend a whole day teaching our students how to see a red light reflex with an ophthalmoscope. And then we spend more time teaching them how to see the light reflex in the ear with the otoscope. Okay, I was an ED nurse. So the reason I never got to do these skills is because in an ED, only one person gets to look in that kid's ears. <laughs> Right, and that's whoever is going to decide if they need antibiotics or not. You're not gonna get a second opportunity. So, 40 years as a nurse, I've never done this for a patient. But I have spent many, many hours teaching students how to do it. Um, you have to start to wonder, and who still teaches the student, you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> but hit the tuning fork on your hand and then put it on top of your head. All right. Now put it behind the ear. Oh, you took too long. You need to bang it on your hand again. And then we spend another day teaching cranial nerves on old Olympus towering top. Yeah. Everybody remembers that, but do you remember the assessment techniques? for the cranial, the cranial nerves. Maybe if you work in a dedicated, specialized, advanced neuro department. <laughs> that doesn't have easy access to an MRI or CAT scan machine, <laughs> right? So if you're working in a low, in a low resource environment or a place where more advanced technology is available, then specially trained nurses should know how to do these things, but not a generalist. I'm just gonna say it. Our students don't need to know that. Use that to teach them how to put the right size blood pressure cuff on. Because <laughs> I am really tired with fighting with nurses who don't understand that my arm is too fat for that regular blood pressure cuff. <laughs> And in order to make it fit right, they just turn it upside down and slide it down the arm. <laughs> I'm like, all righty then. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there are some really obvious things that we can do here to get ourselves started. Now, we can't do this alone though, right? We have to do this in collaboration with our practice partners because I just had lunch with a friend who's a nurse manager the other day, and she said, you know, we get the students and they don't know how, or they, we get the new grads, they don't know how to put in a catheter. I'm like, yeah, because they haven't done it for two years. 
They did it the first semester of school. They never reached competency. They didn't have enough practice time. And you think that they're going to know how to do it? It's not going to work that way. But what if we spent our time teaching really good sterile technique that could apply to anything? What if we taught them to figure out why the patient needs a catheter, what the amount of urine um, indicates, what the color of the urine indicates, and what they need to do next? The nurse manager, and it's, if there are any in the room, they will hate me for this, but if we teach the critical thinking and clinical judgment and prioritization and communication, then maybe they could teach the skills because something has to give, and they're already teaching it anyway because the students don't know or they don't remember. So apply this same thought process to your classroom. What can you eliminate so that you can teach about the social determinants of health? Um, I, I just implore us to think differently about this. There's a lot of smart people in this room, and I briefly thought about telling them to lock the doors and not let you all out until we figured this out, but I, I didn't think that would work. So we need to keep plucking away at the low-hanging fruit, but that's what we're relying on. We're relying on confidence satisfaction, where we need to be looking at the big picture of how do we get these um, nursing students to the point where they can safely take care of patients, and how do we work with our practice partners to understand what those types of patients look like, so that they're not expecting these nurses to come out and be ICU ready, and we know that that's the case, because we always hear from the proud students who got hired directly into ICU. Now, we always hear there's no funding for education, Tim. Yeah, and it might seem to be true, but we're a really large population of people, and I don't think we make enough noise. I think we have an opportunity to come out with a stronger position on this, and I think it's also about making personal connections. So who knows this lady? Who knows who this is? A few of you. So you were in a school that had a history of nursing class, <laughs> right? A whole semester long about the history of nursing. Okay, well, Mildred, Dr. Mildred Montag, she's kind of one of my heroes because with one dissertation, she added the associate degree nursing level. Did she do it by herself? No, she had a dissertation committee. <laughs> And, what, and the sites of her study, but with one dissertation, she, at, she changed drastically nursing education. Now, granted, it didn't all quite come out the way she intended it to in the end, but that doesn't negate the fact that she made it happen. So perhaps there's people in this room, nurse educators, leadership of nursing education organizations, practice partners, there's people in this room that can accomplish the same thing. But we have some difficult conversations ahead of us. Again, my eyes. Um, these conversations are going to be big ones, and they're going to be uncomfortable ones. But I think some of the things we have to start to think about is, did we lose too much of the clinical experience when we moved away from diploma programs? Do we need to have more clinical hours and figure out how to make that happen? Do we need our programs to be longer to get more clinical hours, which eh, it kind of goes back to that diploma question. Does the liberal arts education make a difference? And I'm going to suggest that those of you who are in liberal arts programs that you talk to those faculty and you help them design a course that's about social determinants of health. You can have an entire semester on each of those pillars, which would be much more beneficial than, I mean, I loved my Beauty of Japan course. I did. <laughs> and I enjoyed the archeology span and I enjoyed the music. 
It didn't help me as a nurse, right? Nobody said liberal arts has to be those courses. Why not tie them to social determinants of health? So, our nursing education is experiencing a national and international crisis, and it's time to do the really hard work, the big work. Stop relying on this low-hanging fruit and just be bigger than this. This is a massive problem. Bang on doors to get the funding. You all know about the seven degrees of separation, right? Well, I used to use this when I wanted Nebraska football tickets, back when they actually had a team. And I can say it because I'm from there. Um, every week, if I asked enough people, I ended up with a ticket. Because somebody knew somebody who knew somebody who had what I wanted. If we do that, and if we do it in the private sector, maybe we can find those people who can help us make a difference because we're not getting the funding from the methods and the places that we keep looking to. So if you're interested in working on these big challenges or leading the efforts, I would like to gather your names and your contact information. And then what I'll do, if you send that to me by the end of October, on November 1st, I will connect all of you. I will connect you so that you can form a group, choose a leader or two, create a plan, prioritize the plan, figure out who needs to be involved that's not already on the list. And then you can get started on fixing nursing education. Because as the phrase goes, if it's not you, then who's it going to be? All right, so it's not going to be me, it's going to be you. Because this is gonna take a massive, a massive effort, and I understand that. What I've done is I've put my email on this so that you can send me your contact information. And then I also put a reference list in um, Google Docs. So the QR code is to the references for all of the research studies that I referenced today. So thank you again for coming this morning. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's so great to see you again here in person um, for a second year. I'm Dr. Sue Fernaris. I direct the Division for Innovation and Education Excellence here at the National League for Nursing. What a wonderful opportunity it's been for us to consider the many insights you shared with us, Kim, about how evidence that we are gaining from simulation may help us to solve some of those clinical practice and nursing education for better outcomes. So thank you Lots for that. Yeah, it's wonderful. I also want to extend a special thank you to Lairdall Medical for making this session possible and for the ongoing collaboration and support on so many, many projects at the National League for Nursing. Lairdall has been a supportive collaborator with the NLN since 2003. It's been both a privilege and a pleasure to always collaborate with you, so thank you for that. I would like to invite uh, Rosie Patterson, who's the Vice President of Sales for North America, Lairdall Corporation, to come to the podium to make a special presentation. Thank you, Sue. Well, I am so honored to be here with the NLN this year, uh, the year of the nurse educator, in celebration of nurse educators and the work they're doing in simulation to move the, simula the nursing education agenda forward. This lecture honors Deborah Spunt, who pioneered the use of simulation in nursing education and strategically directed one of the first simulation centers in the U United States at the University of Maryland. I have the privilege of working with Debbie for several years, so I know she would be, as well as we all are, so very proud of her legacy. Dr. Kim Lighton and her many esteemed colleagues continue to champion simulation in nursing education. In this spirit, I would like to recognize the directors, both past and present, of the Deborah Spunt Simulation Center at the University of Maryland at the School of Nursing. With us here today is past director, Dr. Mary Fay, 
and current director, Dr. Amy Daniels. I also want to recognize past director, Dr. Regina Twig. Would you please stand and be recognized? Thank you, and it is with sincere pleasure that I congratulate Hugh Kim today and honor you for presenting the 2022 Spunk Lecture. Over the years, it's been such an honor to work with you, and it's my great privilege to present to you this beautiful crystal in recognition of your lecture today. Would you please join me in thanking Kim for her presentation? Now please go and enjoy some coffee, exhibits, poster viewing, and networking our exhibit hall, and we'll see you here back at 10.30 for the National Faculty Meeting. Thanks, everyone.